and its long and storied history over the course of nearly 200 years, the left wing internationally has had its fair share of conflict over everything from large details over how to build a new society down to small details like petty squabbles and interpersonal conflicts. Yet in spite of these unfortunate incidents of bitter disagreement, long moments of peace and compromise have been achieved for the greater interest. One of the most exemplary moments demonstrating this fact is the fallout of the disastrous split between Marx and Bakuni. This conflict between two powerful thinkers with radically different visions on how to achieve the the same end goal tore us under a powerful force of international rebellion. A split so powerful it resonates still today in the discourse of prominent thinkers all across the political spectrum. In the days leading up to September the 2nd, 1872, 65 delegates appointed by communist and anarchist chapters, parties, and cells all over the world descended on the Café Concert Excelsior, located in the city of The Hague in the Kingdom of the Netherlands. These delegates were in attendance for the fifth meeting of the International Workingmen's Association, a revolutionary socialist organization that variously advocated for the unified establishment of a society free of class boundaries. Four meetings previously had already passed in which previous issues had been hotly debated among the disparate factions within, but few would be as fractious as this one. For between the previous meetings and this one, two prominent thinkers had risen to the forefront of the international socialist thought, Karl Marx and Mikhail Bakunin, and neither were particularly fond of each other. Months earlier, Marx's closest associate, the renowned Friedrich Engels, spoke on the matter of Bakunin's prominence to Theodor Kuno, the leader of the German section of the International. Bakunin, who up till 1868 had intrigued against the International, joined it, and at once began to conspire within it against the General Council. Bakunin has a peculiar theory of his own, a medley of proud honism and communism. I would also ask you to be on your guard when dealing with any of the people connected with Bakunin, you can be sure that any information you give them will immediately be passed on to Bakunin, it is one of his fundamental principles that keeping promises and the like are merely bourgeois prejudice which a true revolutionary must treat with disdain when it benefits the cause. Within this letter Engels openly echoes the distress which he, Marx and their combined adherents held towards Bakunin's anarchists. Not only that their theory was allegedly an absurd mix of proudhonist, a term for proto-anarchist, and communist principles, but additionally that they were backstabbing intriguers who were to be distrusted at all times. Needless to say, this implicit distrust did not encourage cooperation between the two factions. A shadow had already been cast upon the convention of these socialists completely unrelated to the split forming between Marx and Bakunin. A little over one year prior, the world's first successful socialist revolution had taken place in the wake of France's defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, the brief establishment of the Paris Commune. Despite its swift failure, the Commune lasted only for over a month, it was hailed as a stellar example by socialists worldwide. In the words of Marx, The central seat of the old governmental power, and, at the same time, the social stronghold of the French working class, had risen in arms. Paris could resist because, in consequence of the siege, it had got rid of the army, and replaced it by a national guard, the bulk of which consisted of working men. This was the first one, in which the working class was openly acknowledged, as the only class capable of social initiative. And in this moment, between socialists of all creeds, utopian, blankist, anarchist, Marxist, and so on, a sense of compromise reaching across boundaries of ideology for the common good of a new start had been reached. The famous anarchist Peter Kropotkin later recounted, The International Working Men's Association gave this reply. The organization, it said, must not be confined to a single nation. It must extend over artificial frontiers, and soon this great idea sank into the hearts of the people and took fast hold of their minds. Though it has been hunted down ever since by the united efforts of every kind of reactionary, it is alive nevertheless, and when the voice of the rebellious people destroys the obstacles to its development, it will reappear stronger than ever before. Truly, the Paris Commune represented one of the proudest moments of compromise amidst fractious conflicts within the broader left, one which echoed far beyond its last breath. But unfortunately, at the Hague Congress of the IWA, this fairly brief respite from strife was not to be lasting. 
It was said in retrospect by writers such as Boris Nikolaevsky that, on both sides, a feeling pervaded this, this was to be the final united meeting of the association, for hostilities had grown nearly irreconcilable. With the tentative majority of delegates in attendance seemingly backing Marx's ideas over Bakunin's, Marx took the floor to advocate for his and his cadre's vision of socialist revolution in the first and foremost revolution adopted at the Congress. Rather than accede to Bakunin's vision of destroying a state immediately post-revolution, Marx and his comrades outlaid their vision in Resolution 1. This constitution of the working class into a political party is indispensable in order to ensure a triumph of the social revolution, and of its ultimate end, the abolition of classes. The conquest of political power has therefore become the great duty of the working class. Shortly after, Resolution 7 followed it and directly charged at Bakunin and his adherents. The Congress resolved to exclude Mikhail Bakunin. It is to be noted that these votes upon the alliance were taken after a great number of French and German delegates had been obliged to leave. And with this final blow to any remaining power that Bakunin had brokered within the IWA, anarchism as a current within the Congress was crushed. Mere weeks later at the village of saint Emier in Switzerland, an international composed entirely of anarchists declared themselves as the legitimate international, denouncing the now Marxist IWA which had convened at The Hague as being illegitimate. The anarchist-Marxist bonds had officially been severed once and for all. Upon hearing that anarchists and Marxists of the world had officially severed all organizational ties, the famed erstwhile chancellor of the German Empire, Otto von Bismarck, famously remarked, Ground heads. Wealth and privilege may well tremble should ever again the black and red unite. Since then, the wider revolutionary left has known little peace between those who adhere to Marx and those who adhere to the more nebulous tradition started by Bakunin. Numerous conflicts in the 20th century raged between those who advocated for their respective camp. The ardent Marxist Vladimir Lenin ordered that the anarchistic free territory in Ukraine be crushed in 1921. Subsequent Soviet leader Joseph Stalin directed General Alexander Orlov to arrest and execute anarchists during the time of anarchist Catalonia. An anarchist thought was crushed in any subsequent state that the USSR or China held sway over since then. Anti-anarchist attitudes ran deep in the code of Marxist-Leninist, that is to say, statist-communist, thought. Lenin articulated it concisely in a declaration approved by the Executive Committee of the Communist Party years before the Russian Revolution. The executive of the Soviet workers deputies decided yesterday to reject the application of the anarchists for representation on the Executive Committee. The Donotic political struggle, as a means for the achievement of their ideals. Thus began the tradition of all subsequent Marxist revolutions. The active suppression of anarchist thought by most who adhere to that of Marxist thought, and vice versa, just as it was when Bakunin was finally expelled from the IWA Congress. However, though it is the source of arguably the most bitter of conflicts within the wider revolutionary left, the fallout of the split between Marx and Bakunin has not proven itself to be an insuperable obstacle against compromise between factions on the left wing. Some of the most influential socialists since the split have recognized the importance of unity on the left for furthering the cause. In the midst of World War I, Rosa Luxemburg argued, Either the international will remain a refuse heap after the war, or its resurrection will begin on the basis of the class struggle from which alone it draws its vital forces. Not by retelling the same old story will it be revived after the war. In spite of the contentious nature of conflict endemic to the left, many other revolutionaries recognized the vital nature of unity and compromise in building a better future, much like Luxembourg. For every example of a bitter dispute between a Marxist and an anarchist in political thought, one may also cite another instance of cooperation. For the ardent Marxist Vladimir Lenin allowed the free territory to exist unabated for three years before breaking the alliance. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin, though ardently anti-anarchist, supported Spanish communists during Spain's civil war, who at many points cooperated willingly with anarchists during events such as the siege in Madrid, and anarchists often were the brothers in arms of many revolutions thereafter, with anarchist territories like the Sinmin Prefecture in Manchuria cooperating with Mao's Chinese Soviet Republic for several years during the Japanese invasion. At first glance, one might believe that cooperation between anarchists and Marxists within the left is impossible. The conflicts spawned by Marx and Bakunin's original conflict are bitter and sometimes perhaps violent, yet when one looks deeper, compromise does not become impossible at all. In fact, it becomes the most preferable option for achieving one's ambitions in society, whereas his mark himself indeed did say, Crowned heads, wealth and privilege may well tremble should ever again the black and red unite.